Hello everybody. So, as you can see, we've got a different setup today. Um, this is going to be directed at the board. I'm going to actually rotate this around to me now. So I'm just going to have this pointing at me for a minute. As we're talking about the stuff that we've got on the board, I'll point it back towards the board. But for the minute, I'm going to be talking for a bit. So I'm just going to point it at me. So first of all, this is a Q&A session. So I want your questions. So if you have any questions at any point, either now, live, give me your questions, or afterwards, I'll get back to you and I'll answer your questions as well. So I'm just, so because, because of the way that um, going live on, on a phone works, if I do it with my front camera, I can't actually, everything's backwards on the board. So I have to turn my phone around so that everything looks right to you, which means I can't actually see myself. So I've got myself up on another phone here. So I'm just making sure that I'm centered and I'm in a good place. And I am, so that's great. So, um, I've got another phone here as well. So yeah, I'm going absolutely crazy today with the phones. And on this phone, I've got, I've got a website called Answer the Public. And this is a website where you can put in a question, a topic, a subject, whatever you want. And it gives you what people are searching for on Google. So I can look through here. I put constipation in as the keyword. So I've got um, questions. I've got what ifs. I've got so many different. I've got just got so much stuff about constipation. I'm just going to I'm just going to chug through all of these questions and just see how much insight I can give you in about 30 minutes is what I'm, what I'm aiming for. So first of all, let me know you're here. If you're tuning in live, let me know you're here. Um, leave me a like a, a comment saying that you're here. Say hello. Hi William. Hi Billy. How are you doing? Um, I'd love to know you're here. Let me know if constipation is something that you actually struggle with. And um, if it's not, make sure you tag somebody who you know struggles with constipation. And there's no shame about being constipated. It's just, it's your body's talking to you. It's asking for some help. There's, I know as soon as we talk about constipation, it's like, oh, we're talking about poo, toilet humour. I know it can get a bit embarrassing. It can be a bit um, uncomfortable. For me, it's a bit difficult to to connect to these feelings because I literally talk about poo all day. I literally talk about poo with, with my fiance, with my clients, with my family. Literally, it's like poo, poo, poo all day. It's just a normal thing for me. So um, I thought I'd like try to host this this space where we can just we can just talk about poo and it's just like it's a normal thing like everybody everybody poos well hopefully if you're not you're constipated so let's try to get you pooing so let me know you're here leave me your questions i'm going to go through some of these these um, these pre-made questions and yeah well let's get started so i'm sure there's going to be some interesting interesting questions here so I'll give you example constipation gas bloating constipation green poop constipation gallbladder constipation hard stool, constipation hernia, constipation, oh there's some jokes, there's, there's some really good stuff there. So again, leave me all of your questions. I'd rather be answering your questions than the ones up here because then I'm answering questions that, are, that I know that you actually want answered. So let me, be sure to let me know you're here and leave me your questions. So let's go straight into it. I want to pick a good question to get started, to get started on. So First of all, there's a question here. Constipation, what to eat? I think that's a really cool question. And I don't know if you can see, I don't know if it's on the board, if you can see it here. No, you can't. It's slightly over here. I'll just move it slightly. So you see here, we got fiber. Now this is a really, really interesting one. So the thing about, the thing about constipation and fiber is if you go to the doctors and you tell them that you're, that you're constipated, the first thing they're probably going to do is give you a fiber supplement. So this is what it was like for me when I was really struggling with constipation and IBS. So I went in and I got like the psyllium husk and I got given uh, a medication called buscopan. This is a, an antispasmodic drug. Um, so that means if you, if you break that down, antispasmodic basically means it reduces the ability of the muscles to contract. So it stops, it stops, essentially it's a, it's a neurotoxin. So it's, it's a, a nerve poison that affects the ability of the the brain to communicate with the muscle to tell it to move so that it stops, which can give you temporary relief of like cramping and those kinds of like twitching sensations. I have a lot of twitching. It can get rid of those those um, symptoms very quickly, but it doesn't resolve the constipation. In fact, it made it quite a lot worse for me. And it also caused me to develop different kinds of dysbiosis, like 
like SIBO, CIFO kind of overgrowths. Because I think we've also got it written here, yeah? We've got it just down here. So just down here, you've got motility. So as you can imagine, an antispasmodic is absolutely destroying your motility. So this predisposes you to things like bacterial overgrowths, fungal overgrowths, because your motility is... So your intestines are like... They're basically like a hollow tube that go all the way through your whole body. It's actually outside of you if you think about it in a in a in an interesting kind of way. Like your mouth and your whole digestive system is actually outside of you, even though it's inside of you. So it's like a, a tube of you that's outside of you, inside of you, which is fascinating to me. But anyway, this tube it moves food along through something called peristalsis. So this is where the sides of the intestine do this. So they sort of they do this kind of flexion movement, and they don't just go one way, like. If you're going to throw up, for example, they're going in reverse. They're pushing it back up the other way. Or even when you're having like normal digestion, the food doesn't just go one way. It's like after you've liquefied it and you've bound it with loads of acid and it's ready to start being absorbed, it goes into your small intestine and then your small intestine is like wiggle it this way and it, it wiggles it back and then it wiggles it that way again. And it's, it's because all of these little villi that you've got. So imagine these are the walls of the intestine. Along each wall, you've got like all of these little villi. I'm sure you've probably seen a, like an Activia advert or something like that before. So you've got all these little finger-like protrusions that are like, and they're all, all the way around. And even on top of these, so imagine on the top of this lining here, all the way along this, you've got even more little villi. So there's just these little finger-like things going, trying to grab your nutrients. And they've got like enzymes and things that help you absorb your food. So your, your digestive system is like doing this and then moving it back. And it's trying to slosh it around so you can absorb all of this stuff. And when you take um, an antispasmodic, so like buscopan, for example, it stops that from happening. So medications, they don't have like a, a definitive impact on the body that they inhibit. So instead of your peristalsis being like this, like really powerful and, sw and swashing it along, it's like it gets a bit weak and sedated and it's like kind of disabled, but it doesn't work as well as it should. So this is going to affect your nutrient absorption. This is going to affect, this actually can make your constipation a lot worse. It makes sense, right? Because... If you're constipated because your peristalsis isn't strong, taking an antispasmodic is going to make it worse. But then, as I said, also given a fibre supplement. And there's actually an inverse correlation between constipation and fibre, which is... It makes you ask the question, like, why is, why is the doctor giving me fibre if fibre actually causes constipation? So I just realised I don't actually have the live up properly yet, so... Let me just get it open so I can see if we get any questions. Sam Cass says, hello. Hi, Sam. How you doing, man? Um, everybody else, let me know that you're here. So um, if, you're, if you're constipated, increasing fibre, more often than not, actually increases the symptoms of constipation. So yes, you will probably have a bigger stool. You'll have a bigger stool mass, but it can actually decrease the amount of time that you're going regularly. It can also really increase the hardness, which makes it a lot harder to pass. And... Like, if you, if you really understand the science of how constipation works, having more fibre does not make a lot of sense. So, I personally, I'll tell you a bit about, about my personal success story. So, um, I used to be constipated, like, like, really, really bad. Like, super hard stools, go in maybe once every five to seven days if I was lucky. And it was really, it was really crap. It was really bad. It was awful because it wasn't just the bowel discomfort that I had. I also had fibromyalgia pains and brain fog and all of these things would lift a little bit after I'd have a bowel movement. I would do what the doctors are saying, eat more fibre, eat your whole grain, take your psyllium husk and it would just get worse and worse and worse. And now I've actually transitioned to a point where after having been dependent on laxatives and enemas for like, so I was constipated for about 10 years and the last five years or so I've been using enemas and laxatives to go to the toilet because you know what it's like. like if, you're, if you're watching and you're constipated, you know how bad it is being constipated. It absolutely sucks. It's horrible. So if it got to the point where it was longer than three days, it's like, well, I have to do something because I actually was aware of how dangerous dangerous it is to be constipated because, yes, I am trying to solve the gut problems, but I also had a whole host of other problems, arthritis and like Sjogren's syndrome, so autoimmune type conditions, gastritis, also in the gut, but things like chronic fatigue syndrome, anxiety, depression, depersonalization. And all of these would get worse the longer I stayed constipated. And I also know that being constipated predisposes you to things like chronic fatigue syndrome, cancer, loads of like stuff you'd really rather avoid if you can. 
So it would get to three days and I'm like, nope, I have to do something about it. So I'd, I'd use laxatives. Um, so for me, that was either using magnesium or using salt, a salt flush, which wasn't, it's not great. Like it has negative consequences, put a lot of work on my kidneys. Um, it was dehydrating. It was a stressful thing for my body, but it was like, I get to choose. Do I want this stress or do I want the stress of being constipated? And I was chosen, choosing that stress. I didn't want to be constipated because I knew, I knew how bad it was. And now I've transitioned to a point where I only have a bowel movement every single day, literally like without fail. I think in the last three months, I've missed having a bowel movement maybe two or three times. Two of them I know were because of emotional issues, which a lot of my constipation was actually caused by. And one of them was just because I forgot. So as part of this recovery process, I still, most days, I would say 80% of the time, I don't get the urge to go to the toilet. It's not, it's not there yet. Like I don't feel like, oh, like you know, like you can get that, that feeling like it's knocking at the door. It's like it's asking to come out. And it's like, oh, I need to go to the toilet. I don't get that yet. But if I go and sit on the toilet and I, I, I create the space, my, my bowel's just like, cool, let's go to the toilet. And I can go every single day, which is quite remarkable considering that I've been dependent on laxatives anonymous for over five years. And I'm at a point where I don't have any fiber in my diet. I do have some soluble fiber, but like insoluble fiber wise, which is like the psyllium husks and the brand flakes and all the stuff that they promote to help you with constipation. Removing that is actually one, one of the most significant factors to me resolving this problem. Monique Flynn says, hi, I've been exactly the same as you for 10 years. I'm so sorry, Monique. It is, it's horrible to, to be constipated. Do you, do you also have the, the other side of things happening to you as well so is it is it just the constipation and the gut problems that you've got or do you notice that the longer you stay constipated you get low energy you're just a bit cranky a bit irritable life just feels hard and it's it's exhausting to just to just go along whereas when when, when you can go to the toilet every day like where i'm at now so i i say this not to not to boast not to, to brag about it i mean i am happy like, i'm so happy about this achievement I think it is boast worthy, especially if you've been constipated, you know how this is such an achievement. But I'm not saying this with the intention of, of boasting. What I want to do is give you the insight that I learned. Like if I've if I've done it, like I'm not special. I'm just a regular person. Like I'm 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 nobody special. But if I can do it, there's no reason you can't do it. And if I figured it out for me, I can probably help you figure it out as well. So that's why I'm trying to do this question and answer session and try to clue you in into where you where you might be stuck and what we can do to try to resolve it so anybody else joining let me know you're here give me your questions please i'd way prefer to answer your questions than answer the questions on this on this app because they're not going to be as specific as what you need so give me your question i've managed to reach the point where bowel movement every single day um still still isn't perfect still don't get 100 percent evacuation every single day um but we're getting there we're making huge progress going from the point where I literally could not even survive without laxatives and enemas to the point where I can I can poo every day. Pretty happy with that, and you can do it too. That's quite an interesting one. Constipation and nausea. So why would why would being constipated cause nausea? So when you're constipated, you're getting a lot of reabsorption of different types of toxins. So you you know poo is is not clean. Like your body is getting rid of toxins, it's getting rid of dead bacteria, live bacteria, nasty stuff. Recently, I would say that I'm even noticing that you get rid of like emotions, you can have emotional discharges and different like, other types of experience. Like you process your past and your experiences and it comes out in your stool. I've had days where I've literally not eaten enough to have had like physical stool mass and I still go to the toilet. It's like, well, where did that come from? <laughs> I didn't eat anything that day. I literally had nothing. Where did that come from? And it's th 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 there's, there's something more to it. So what can be causing this, this nausea? And what, I, what also interests me is as the length of time that you've been constipated increases, the amount of nausea that you experience also probably increases. And this, is, this really comes down to the liver and the liver health. So everything that's happening in your whole digestive system, small in, so stomach up here, small intestine here, and even down here, so you've got the lower small intestine. So you've got, your small intestine actually has three parts. You've got the ileum, you've got the jejunum, and you've got the cecum. So this goes, so everybody's, everybody's different. It's not like you can map it out, but your stomach's over here and then it's like, comes in, you've got the duodenum and it's like, like 18 meters of just wiggly lines. And then it comes to your ileocecal valve, which is down here. And then it enters your, your colon and then your colon goes up, across and up and then down and then you poop. 
So everything, all of the blood supply, everything that comes from your digestive system at any point along this whole point that I just described goes through a blood portal system called the portal hepatic vein. So all of this comes into this big vein that comes up here and it goes straight to your liver. So everything that comes from your digestive system before it enters your body. So this includes beneficial things like nutrients, vitamins, minerals. This includes bad things like endotoxins or bacterial fragments or say you breathed in a lot of mold and swallowed it. All of those toxins, they, if they absorb, they come in through the digestive system and they go through the portal hepatic vein into the liver. And the liver, if the liver is struggling, the liver is overwhelmed, if the liver is overworked, you're going to feel nauseous. You're going to have no appetite because your liver has such a huge role in your digestion, especially of fat, because it has to produce bile to be able to digest those, those fatty acids, those fat soluble nutrients. But regardless of that, even if you're eating carbs, even if you're eating protein, every single thing that comes from your digestive system has to go through your liver. So it's bad things, but it's also good things. So if you've got this, if you've got five days worth of poo that you're like holding on to in your colon, there's toxins that are constantly leaching out of that, that you're that are going into the portal back vein and reabsorbing back to your liver and giving your liver more work. Your liver's like, this is a toxin. I don't want this. Get it, get rid of it. So it pushes it out into the lymphatic system, into the bile, tries to excrete it. But then the bile empties into the small intestine. The lymphatic system primarily exits the, into the small intestine. And then it goes down into the colon, where you're still not having a bowel movement. It gets reabsorbed again, and your liver has to do it all over again. Your liver's tired. So as you're more and more constipated from this fecal reabsorption, you just have no appetite. You just feel nauseous, because the constipation is overwhelming the liver's ability to process things. But this is really good news, because if we can get the bowel moving, moving regularly, say we're having a bowel movement every day, we take so much work off the liver. So... A saying that I often say is a lot is when you when you can't go to the toilet, it's, it really stresses you out. It really like even mentally stresses you. But then you go to the toilet and you feel like it takes a load off your mind. And that's really true because your liver is also what's filtering all of the blood that's moving through your body. So if your liver isn't having to process all of these toxins that are reabsorbing, it filters your blood better, which means you've got better blood going into your brain and you feel better and you don't have as much anxiety, depression, worry. It's really nice. Oh, we got some comments. Cool. So Multi Patel says, hi, Benny. Can you become laxative dependent, especially stimulant laxatives? So give me an idea of what stimulant laxatives you're talking about. I don't personally have any real experience with stimulant laxatives because first of all, they didn't they didn't really help me. I could take stimulant laxatives. They didn't do anything. And I really only have experience with osmotic type laxatives. So that was really like magnesium. Um, so that's magnesium oxide, magnesium sulfate. If any of you have ever tasted Epsom salts before. You're very brave because they are vile. I've tasted so many different horrible things on my healing experience, my healing journey. And I'd say magnesium sulfate, Epsom salts, is probably number one. It's definitely in the top three. Maybe maybe it's about even with trephala. So if you've ever tasted trephala or Epsom salts, I'm so sorry for you. Your constipation must be quite bad. So give me an idea of what stimulant laxative you're talking about and I'll... Um, and I'll get back to you on that. Monique. Monique Flynn says, what did you do to turn it around? Did you just change your diet as I can't eat fibre at all, as it makes me so bad? I have to take laxatives every two days as my bowels just don't work. If I don't take laxatives, I go once a week. I have IBS, SIBO, dysbiosis, fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. So you're literally describing exactly what it was that I was describing. The, this connection between gut, constipation and things like chronic fatigue syndrome. Super connected. I'll be really interested, Monique. Do you notice that when you go to the toilet, your chronic fatigue syndrome lessens? Do you, do you, is that something that you've noticed? Do you notice that if you don't take the laxative, that your chronic fatigue syndrome symptoms begin to gradually increase until you do go to the toilet? Let me know, I'd be interested. I need to get my bowels working. Can you advise me of a plan to help me go to the toilet, please, and thanks? Yes, I can definitely help you with that, Monique. Um, so you sound very similar to the exact same position I was in, so I'm probably in a pretty good, good position to help you with that. Um, so first of all, I'm just going to point you over here to, to this board. So you see on this board, we've got these blue things, the blue things that are in, fiber, trauma, electrolytes, motility, probiotics, bile, and liver function. These are the, the primary factors that I focused on improving to, to remedy my, my gut problems. I've actually got, so what, what I'm actually working on currently is a class that's gonna go through all of these things. 
So I've broken it down into six key points. So it is things like electron. I know electrolytes is one, motility is one, probiotics. Probiotics is coming under the subcategory of the microbiome because it's it's more than just taking beneficial bacteria. It's about making sure this gut ecology is working really well. So bile and liver function, they're so connected, they're going to come together. Trauma is going into motility disorders. Fibre, we already talked a lot about fibre today, but I'm going to go more into detail in, on it in that. So if you're interested in to do this, this class is going to be literally perfect for you. If you leave me a little poo emoji, you know the little the little um, the emoji with a, that's like a little poo with eyes. Leave me that. Anybody watching, and I'll give you some more information about this class, so you can you can come along and I can try and help you with this like more personally. Sharon Adut, very cool surname. I like it. What is your treatment for chronic constipation? So this is a tricky one. First of all, it depends on the root cause. So. All of these things are important, and those six key points that I mentioned, usually the root cause is one of those six things. So the six things that we're going to be talking about in the class, they're, I'm going to talk about all of them, but not all of them are going to necessarily apply to you. It might only be one or two. In cases like, like more complicated situations, like what Monique was saying, it's probably more like five or six. Like for me, it was all six. All six of these things I had. Problems with fibre, my electrolytes were out of balance, my motility didn't work for, for multiple reasons. There was physical trauma, there was emotional trauma, my liver was absolutely congested, my bile flow was horrible, my microbiome was so off, all of this was a mess. So I had to pick all of these things up. And it, it depends on what your root cause is. But through the so constipation is like this big bucket, like a huge bucket that you get thrown in. But depending on which of these issues are your 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 like primary factors that need improvement depends on how your constipation manifests so you might go to the toilet every day but have a really hard stool that's still constipation but to me that says there's probably an imbalance in the level of probiotics in the gut or the bile and liver function isn't working well but that means that the motility is probably working quite fine because it's moving through regularly so how do i resolve this it, it's a, it's a complicated thing. We have to really look at, based on what symptoms you're expressing, what the body is asking for help with, and where it where it's asking for help. So say you're, um, say so some people we we've, we've been talking about SIBO, Monique. Maybe she's got SIBO constipation. I know many people go, they have SIBO constipation, but they also have SIBO diarrhea. So they've got SIBO CD. So they swap back and forth. They've got constipation for a week, and then they'll go to the toilet, and it'll be diarrhea. And it's like, what's going on there? This is this is why I want to make this class so I can go into this in more detail because it's complicated. I, I won't I won't deny it. it is complicated, but it, it is understandable and it is a solvable problem and, and that's why I what I really want to help you with. So I've designed the class to be a one off, like a one shot, just to give you everything that you need to learn that. Monique says, Yes, I do. All of my symptoms go away. So Monique notices that as her constipation increases, so do all of the other symptoms that she has associated with things like chronic fatigue syndrome. One that I noticed was very interesting was I struggled with Sjogren's syndrome, which is an autoimmune condition where your body attacks your mucosal membranes. And I would really notice in my eyes, my eyes would get really dry. And the more constipated I was, the drier my eyes would get. And now that I'm going basically every single day, my eyes are so much less dry, which is which is awesome because I can see that I can see more clearly. I get less eye strain and having dry eyes is just a really annoying feeling. Dom. Hey, Dom. How you doing, man? Haven't spoke for you for a little bit. It's nice to have you along one of these lives. Um, he says, both Epsom salts and Trafala are foul. Yeah, they are absolutely disgusting. Has anybody else in here had to eat um, Trafala or Epsom salts? What, what, is the, what is the most foul tasting thing that you've ever tried to resolve your constipation? I'd be really interested to, I'd be really interested to know. So Monique's left me a poop emoji. So I'll get back to you with a message about that, Monique. Cheryl Barandi. Hi, Cheryl. Lovely to have you. What about gallbladder and digestion? This is a huge one because you can't talk about gallbladder without talking about liver because gallbladder function is dependent on liver function. So the gallbladder's job is basically to hold and to concentrate bile. And the liver is what's producing bile. So we need to make sure that the liver, first of all, has enough space. And if it's constipated, so if you're constipated, all of that poo that's in your colon and is reabsorbing, recirculating toxins to your liver is taking up so much of your liver's work and time it doesn't have enough resources to create new bile to to cleanse like 
oxidative species and reactive oxygen species and inflammatory compounds. It's too busy trying to just process all of this reabsorption from the poop. So one of the best things you can do to support the bile is actually get the bowels moving regularly. And something that we're going to talk about in this in this class coming up is is enemas. Enemas are they're not they're not the most pleasant, but once you get used to them, like I can do an enema like like that. It's easy. It's it's nothing to me. I can talk about them like they're they're nothing. Technically, they're kind of like a medical procedure, but for me, it's just like it's just as easy for me to do an enema as like brush my teeth. It's like second nature kind of thing. And when we do an enema, we immediately cleanse the whole bowel of all of this toxicity, which just gives the liver more space so it can focus on making higher quality bile, which can actually resolve the constipation in the long run. Because sometimes we're constipated because the bile isn't isn't functioning properly. There's two primary mechanism, mechanisms for this. The first is if you aren't producing bile. So we have to look at the jobs that bile does. So first of all, bile is an emulsificant so it means it's it's like soap so you can imagine bile to dish soap it's a really good comparison so if you if you wanted to make this like really simple you could just imagine that your liver is making washing up liquid that's that's basically what bile is so why do we use washing up liquid why do we use soap so first of all we use it because if you say you've got like a jar of coconut oil and you put your hand in coconut oil and you took it back out and you try to just wash your hand with with water like what's going to happen you're going to have oil over your hand no matter what you do you can try to rub it off now you've got oil on both hands like it's not going to come off without soap and this is because these fats are hydrophobic so they, they don't mix they don't mix and the job of bile of soap of washing up liquid is to make it so that these hydrophobic compounds can dissolve in liquid in water which is which is necessary for us to be able to digest and absorb them if we don't get these fats to become emulsified, our digestive enzymes cannot touch them. They, it's like you've got the digestive enzymes in the watery part down here and the fat floating on the top. Like they can't mix. So the digestive enzymes don't mix and you don't absorb anything. So this means you get fat soluble vitamin deficiencies. This means that you get you don't have you don't have ingredients to make cholesterol and you use cholesterol to make. Um, cortisol and adrenaline and estrogen and testosterone and all of your steroid and sex hormones so if that's bad it's going to mess your adrenals up and you use you actually use fat to make new bile and a lot of the ingredients that you need to make new bile are fat soluble so if you don't have this this good absorption cycle going on you, you're not you're not having the ingredients you need to make new bile and then you can't absorb the things that you need to make new bile it's a really vicious cycle so first of all, we need it for that. And this, the, the bile acids and the, the combination of the bile and the fat in the stool is very lubricating. It's what allows the stool to move along very quickly. But even perhaps even more sinister than that is what, what's the second reason that you wash your hands? It's not just to get oil off. It's to kill bacteria. It's to kill viruses. It's to, to get them off the hands. It's to remove biofilms that have built up. So say you've got poor bile flow in your digestive system and it's no surprise that you've got SIBO and candida overgrowth and you've got biofilms and you've got all these problems. It's because bile is the natural cleansing mechanism of the small intestine. So if the bile isn't flowing properly, you're going to have problems with bacteria overgrowing and biofilms developing. All of this becomes a massive source of toxicity. You don't digest your food properly, which contaminates the liver, which means the liver can't make more bile. And you get stuck in this horribly vicious cycle. And it's a really... It's a difficult cycle to break because there's so many different factors that come into it. And that's why I built this class, because you have to make sure that you address all these six factors. If you've got constipation, say, for example, you've got constipation, you may have tried five of these six, thing, six things that I'm going to show you, but you've only tried one at a time. You haven't tried them all at the same time. And doing them all at the same time is what's required, because if you don't do them all at the same time, you don't break this cycle. It just perpetuates and it just perpetuates and it, you're just stuck forever and it doesn't ever resolve. And once you start to make a little bit of progress, the inverse is true. So instead of it perpetuating a cycle of ill health, it begins to su circulate this cycle of, of good health. So as bile begins to flow better, you clean the small intestine out. Overgrowth are removed. Biofilms are removed. You begin to absorb fat soluble nutrients you begin to absorb cholesterol so you can make steroid hormones sex hormones cortisol so your stress response comes down so your leaky gut reduces which means you don't absorb as many toxins 
your liver begins to function better, which means you're now producing even better bile and you get stuck in this massive positive feedback loop instead of this horrible negative feedback loop. So it's really about figuring out where in this vicious cycle you're stuck and supporting it through wh whatever's necessary. So you might need support in three of these things at the same time. You might need four. Me, I need all six. And if I didn't do all six, I wouldn't have made any progress. I was doing five of them for about six months without any progress. And for me, the final step was, I've got it over here, trauma. This was emotional trauma. So this was about fear. I was holding a lot of fear in my colon. And as a result, my colon was holding on to a lot of poo. So I'd done all of these things. My stool wasn't hard anymore. There was enough mass. I was, I was like, my motility was good enough. I was regular to go, but I was still afraid. And I was holding on to it. And so my colon wouldn't let it go. I did this final piece of the puzzle. And voila, I can go to the toilet every single day now. I hope you're finding this interesting. If you're finding this interesting so far, let me know. Cheryl Bernardi says glycerin suppositories. I love them. So glycerin suppositories, I'm not such a fan of these because these these are these act like a stimulant. These act like a stimulant laxative. Um, my preferred version of an enema would basically just be water. So you could use up to I'd say probably a litre is probably a good place to start for a beginner. And this way you're not stimulating this. Um, when you think of a stimulant laxative, instead of, I always think of it like a child. So I always try, to, my, metaphorically to me, my digestive system is like a child. I'm really angry at it because I want it to work properly. So it's like, it's a child that's trying its best, is going to it and like whipping it and saying like, do better, work harder. That doesn't really help. Like you can imagine approaching a child like that, it doesn't really help. And a stimulant laxative is kind of like going to the child and saying like, get on the floor and give me 10 press ups. It's like, it's already trying really hard and it, it's struggling and that's why it's having problems. So instead of going for a stimulant, I would try to go more for encouragement, like a positive reinforcement approach to the child. So instead of saying like, you're useless, you're pathetic, like get down and give me 20. You go in and say like, oh wow, you're doing really well. I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a hand. Like I just wanna, I just wanna support you a little bit. And instead of coming with this harsh, pushy energy, it's very nourishing. It comes from a place of love. It's very supportive and nourishing. It's like, oh yeah, I can see you're trying to go to the toilet. Let me do a, a water enema. It'll help to soften your stool up and it'll give you a bit of stimulation to go, but it's very gentle. It's not so aggressive. And this way you don't run so much of a risk of dependency on stimulant laxatives. And you're also really supporting the body gently. So when we're doing an enema this way, like a water enema, there's, there's so many different benefits. There's a lot of vagus nerve stimulation. So if you've got, if you have trauma and you have um, difficulties with your, with regulating your nervous system, you have a tendency to be in fight or flight instead of rest and digest. The process of doing an enema and holding it stimulates the digestive system to, to do these cleansing waves. And this, this is all um, nerve input that comes up the vagus nerve and stimulates the body to say like, oh, we're safe, we're, we're at rest. Let's produce digestive enzymes. Let's make stomach acid. Let's have peristaltic waves. Let's make new bile. Let's have an immune system instead of trying to fight with everything. And it's it's a gentle, more, it, it, it's a more wholesome way to do it. It's encouraging instead of forcing. And in my, in my experience, that's the only way that has worked for me. Every time I try to force, I get horrible pushback. But if I'm gentle and I go into it from a space of love, and consideration and understanding that my body's smart and it's trying to do something and I just need to help it, it always it always appreciates that and, and actually works with me instead of feeling like I'm smashing my head against the wall. Kelly says, so interesting, all makes so much sense. Thank you, Kelly, I'm, I really appreciate that. And she left a poo emoji, so I'll get back to you, Kelly. I'll give you more information about this class coming up. Cheryl says, it just initiates muscles, pass in a minute. I have low motility, enemas I use, but messes with drying colon out, I was told. The issues with the drying the colon out would be sort of like an electrolyte style of thing. So remember what we talked about before with electrolytes up here. Um, I did actually have another question about electrolytes. I think I might have skimmed over. Yes, Sharon said, which electrolytes are best? Definitely go over that in the class. My favorite is juicing because juicing gives you all of the right electrolytes in the right balance. It provides the right type of fiber that you need. It stimulates motility. It gives you probiotics. It's super detoxifying for the liver and for the and it's stimulating bile flow. It's by far the, the best way to, to solve a lot of these different things. But there's nuance to it and that's, that's what the class is for. So that was electrolyte wise. So if you're doing enemas, 
and you're concerned about electrolytes, you can add electrolyte powder to the enema. The only reason that the colon would be dehydrated by this, by this process of doing an enema would be if you're using plain water. If you were to mix a little bit of salt in it or to use other types of sort of like an electrolyte mix so you could do like, I don't know if you've heard of snake juice. And that's a, a quite a, an interesting blend of different types of electrolytes. Electrolytes are osmotic and this is why magnesium works as a laxative. Magnesium is an electrolyte. So what happens with osmosis is you can imagine the molecule likes to bring water closer to it. So if you're doing, um, if you're doing say like a, an enema and you're putting electrolytes in it, it's going to keep the liquid in the bowel instead of absorbing it. And then this absorption process would be because you have higher levels of electrolytes inside the body, which is a good thing, but it's going to mean that the, the colon can become dehydrated. So making sure that you're remedying, remedying electrolytes from the top down first with like diet and juicing and electrolyte supplements is the most important thing. But secondly, if you're worried about that, you can add electrolytes to the enema to prevent this to prevent this issue. Okay, I'm going to be finishing up really soon. I'm going to take one more question from from here, and in the meantime, while I'm doing that question, I'm I want all of the all of the rest of your questions, so I can so I can answer them. Kelly says so relatable. Positive encouragement instead of harsh self punishment. Exactly. That's that's the only way it's worked for me. I feel like a lot of my healing journey has been a very profound and deep lesson in self-love, which sounds poetic, it sounds, 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 sounds nice, right? But it, re it really has been for me. Because I used to just be like, I'd, I'd get annoyed. I'd be like, why aren't you working? Like, just go, like, let go of the stool. Like, go to the toilet. Why are you broken? But now my perspective is, my body knows exactly what it's doing. And I just need to try and support it to do what it's trying to do. And it really comes from less softening the ego and coming to it from a place of love which has not been easy for me so any questions let me know i'm going to go for one last question oh here's a good one constipation or piles that's a cool one so piles for those of you that don't know is hemorrhoids so this is going to really tie into what we just talked about a minute ago and you're going to this is going to blow your mind this is really cool so if any of you are brave enough to say yeah i've had constipation and i've had i've had hemorrhoids leave me a little a little thingy in the chat. I'll put one. I'll, I'll put one in now because that was me. Like I was. So I've put one in the chat. That was me. Constipation and hemorrhoids. So it got to the point where I would be afraid to go to the toilet because every time I would, it would hurt so much. I'd have to strain so hard. And like you see blood in the toilet, like that is scary. You see, you see blood anywhere. That immediately just triggers stuff, and you're like, oh my god, I'm dying. Like what's going on? I'm in despair, like, what do I do about this? What the hell is happening? And, like, that issue for me, again, completely resolved. That's something I actually resolved quite a few... This is something you can get relief from, like, like, like really quick. Like, so, class is going to be really good for that. But I'm going to help you understand the, the process that's occurring that makes hemorrhoids happen. So, do you remember before we were talking about the portal hepatic vein? Everything that wants to come from the digestive system, so all of your small intestine, all of your stomach, all of your large intestine, everything comes through the same vein and goes up the portal hepatic vein into the liver. So imagine the liver is really struggling. It's overwhelmed. It can't handle every job that it's trying to do. What happens to its filtration rate? It decreases which means the blood isn't flowing through it so quickly because it's, it's really struggling to filter. So as a result, the pressure in this part of the bloodstream, the portal hepatic vein, increases. So the blood pressure increases. And what do you think happens when the blood pressure in that, that system increases? The veins begin to protrude out, out of the rectum because there's so much pressure on this system that they just cannot... They cannot stay where they're supposed to and they begin to bulge out of the anus or even internal hemorrhoids. This can be because the, there's so much pressure on this on this system that we can't filter the blood fast enough and it's pooling before it reaches the liver. So if we can do something or many things, so first of all, if we can get regular, that really supports the liver a lot. But there's so many other things we can do. And these are things I'm going to I'm going to cover all of these in this class. So if you haven't left your little poo emoji yet. Leave your poo emoji and I'll get, I'll get back to you, give you more informa information about that class. 
If we can take the workload off the liver, support the liver function, it, it can begin to filter the blood faster. So the blood comes through quicker, which means the hemorrhoids, they go away by themselves because they're, they're not necessary anymore. They're an adaptive response. The body is saying, right, we can't handle all of this stuff flowing through the portal hepatic vein into the liver this quickly. So it kind of creates a car park to hold that blood until it's ready. And that car park is hemorrhoids. So if you make it so that the, the traffic is flowing through the liver quicker, faster, with less of a backup, less traffic, you don't need this car park to hold onto this reservoir of blood. Hemorrhoids go away. Hemorrhoids are not an issue for me anymore. They haven't been for about five years. Occasionally, when I have a stressful event, say, for example, say I get exposed to mold for some reason, hemorrhoids come back. It's because my liver is really struggling for a short time, but I can do these strategies that I'm going to teach you, and it supports the liver function. They don't need to pull the blood anymore. Hemorrhoids go away. It's really as simple as that. So, Monique says, when will this class be? Will you please private message me about this? Yes, I will. If you've left, if anybody's left me a poo emoji, I will definitely get back to you. I was just writing a text about it earlier to give you some more information, so I'll give you that. This class is going to be, I believe it's going to be in about, it's between a week, two weeks. So in the very, very close future. Um, Monique also says, thank you so much for your time today. Absolutely my pleasure, Monique. I hope this has given you a completely new perspective and understanding on what's going on here. And the thing that I hope it's given you the most is, is hope that this is resolvable. Because I remember when I was struggling with this for years and I didn't know if it would ever improve. Like I could have stuck with everything that I was doing if I just knew, like if I had some certainty that it's like what I'm doing works and it will get me the result and everything will be okay. And it's like it would have, I would have been able to be okay with that. But that uncertainty of like, does this work? Has anyone done this before? Will I get dependent on laxatives? Will I get dependent on enemas? Am I just making things worse? But now to have gone through it and resolved it, I hope what I can give you is the hope and the the inspiration that like this is a solvable problem with the right approach. It, it will go away and it, and it does. So um, I've, I've really loved doing this. If you've enjoyed this, let me know and I'll, I'll do this some more. We can I, I'll do this about loads of different topics. Give me your topics. Give me your feedback, any criticism, anything that I can do to make this better please let me know. And if there's anything that I can do to help you, if you're interested in this class, if you want to talk to me personally, if you have a question, whatever it is, add me, send me a friend request. I add everybody and send me a message and like, let's just talk. Like, if I can help you, I really want it. So that's everything. I've really enjoyed this and I'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye.